tonight. Some well-known Saskatchewan party MLAs will not be seeking re-election. Also, how a serious backlog of children who need autism assessments is affecting families and classrooms. Plus, after nearly two months on hold, the Canada-US rivalry series will continue in Saskatoon, showcasing the best women's hockey on the continent. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Tuesday, February 6th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with news that will change the political roster in Saskatchewan. Four high-profile Saskatchewan party MLAs have announced they will not seek re-election. Today, the party announced that Dustin Duncan, Don McMorris, Gordon Wyant, and Donna Harpower will not run in this year's provincial election. Harpower is actually the longest-serving cabinet minister in Canada. She and McMorris were both first elected back in 1999. In a statement, Premier Scott Moe thanked the MLAs for their years of public service. The list of Sask Party MLAs who won't be on the ticket continues to grow. At last tally, it's losing at least 10, including Don Morgan. As it stands, the next election is scheduled for the end of October of this year. The Saskatchewan Ministry of Health is dealing with a serious backlog of children who need autism assessments. And as Jesse Anton reports, the wait is affecting kids in the classroom. Michelle Kramer says her seven-year-old son's report card should be a clear indicator he needs an autism assessment. So he has green in all the areas except for the red triangle he has with social skills. Kramer says she first tried to get him assessed for autism spectrum disorder or ASD through Child and Youth Services five years ago. It wasn't until early last spring she was put on the wait list. She was told then to expect a call in January of 2025. In the meantime, the single mom is down to part-time hours at work. And that's because she keeps getting calls from her son's school, asking for her to pick him up because he's disrupting his class. It, it, it starts to feel impossible. I'm not living a normal life and I'm asking for help not getting it. The Ministry of Health has confirmed with CBC News as of the end of 2023, there were slightly more than 1,700 kids under 18 waiting for a public ASD assessment. The increasing complex needs of students is a major sticking point in the teachers' labour dispute with the government. The Ministry of Education says a new pilot program in eight city schools is meant to help, and so is the $20 million it's given divisions to hire staff to respond to classroom complexities. It says this money isn't tied to a medical diagnosis, but some divisions say documentation from a third party, like a doctor, helps determine what extra support is needed. That's what Kramer is looking for. And this isn't fair to the staff and the admin at his school because now my son is chewing up all their time and they have a whole school that they're responsible for. Shannon Hill is a board certified behavior analyst in Saskatoon and says Kramer and her son are not alone. There's just not enough of those people to go around to be able to see these kids, number one. Number two, the cost involved if you have to have someone do a private assessment is onerous for some people. It's just not going to happen. Kramer says a $3,000 private ASD assessment is not an option for her, and she worries about the long-term impact of putting it off. Some experts say if kids don't have the supports they need early on, it could lead to higher school dropout rates and lower literacy levels. At this point, Kramer doesn't anticipate that for her son, and she says she sees the effort school staff are making to meet his and her needs. Because as admin and teachers, they see, they see this, they acknowledge this, they, they see the impact that it has on families. Kramer says she'll support teachers when they go on strike because in her eyes, it means they're fighting to help her son. <laughs> Jesse Anton, CBC News, Regina. A Saskatoon hospital is facing unprecedented overcrowding. One patient says she eventually got a bed right at the main doors to the emergency room. Jason Warwick has more. That's the doors right where I was sitting. And then the security station, so this is where they were turning people away. Shailen Cowper was suffering intense abdominal pain Monday night. She drove herself to the St. Paul's Hospital emergency room. Vomiting repeatedly, she waited seven hours to get a bed. 
But when she got one, it wasn't a private room. It wasn't a shared room with curtains. It wasn't even in the hallway. Those spaces were all filled. She says she was rolled into the emergency room's front entrance in full view of everyone. I've never really felt so exposed just being right in the entryway doors, sitting on a bed. Um, so it was a terrible experience. And the nurses, I mean, they did absolutely everything they could. Um, they just looked so defeated by the time I left. It was really disheartening. It was so crowded, staff activated a provision in the regulations for the first time. Managers were called in to handle all non-essential medical duties. The head of the province's nurses union says this is unacceptable. Our members are just saying, like, we, we have no other choice but to do this. Patients' lives are at risk, and, and, you know, people that are coming are having to wait. Well, they're having to wait because there's just not enough registered nurses to be able to give care to the hundreds of percentages of people over capacity that there are at St. Paul's Hospital. It's very become a very dangerous, unmanageable situation. A Saskatchewan Health Authority official said these pressures are the result of several days in a row of higher than average admission volumes. He says they're working hard to increase the number of beds and staff at St. Paul's and other hospitals, but they're also working hard to increase supports and number of beds in the community. As for Cowper, she's now back home recovering, but she says this experience has left her worried about her own safety and for the staff. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Saskatoon. We're learning more about the clinic closure in Pelican Narrows. Medical staff are struggling to keep up with drug-fueled shootings and stabbings, so they're turning away non-urgent cases, except for sick babies, elders and pregnant women. Nurses say they're worried about their own safety and burnout. We spoke to a doctor who's worked there for seven years about the situation on the ground. I mean, we're seeing multiple gunshot wounds uh, in in all ages of people, but but even as young as the mid-teens, um, stabbings, machete attacks, things like that. And the gunshot wounds aren't pellet guns, they're shotguns, sawed-off shotguns, rifles. Um, we've had people with injuries to, you know, rifle injuries to the face, shotguns to the chest, legs, arms. I think my biggest concern is that if if the staff do decide to, to walk out out of necessity, then there are no services available. And um, the physicians won't be able to do anything on their own, uh, even if we decided to stay. Um, we're very limited in what we can do. We rely heavily on the nurses. The nurses are really the heart and soul of, of what runs the healthcare here alongside all the other support staff. And, um, you know, if people walk out, it's, um, it could be detrimental to the community as a whole. In Saskatoon, police are looking for a U-Haul truck in connection with a recent homicide. This after 32-year-old Chantal Lee McLaren was charged with first-degree murder after an incident early Saturday. It happened on the 600 block of Lisker Avenue. The vehicle in question is a 14-foot Ford U-Haul truck, Arizona license plate AEO 5517. Police have not identified the victim or given a cause of death. Officers did shoot a man early Saturday morning when they were executing a search warrant. That's when officers found a man dead inside the house. The man who was shot is still in hospital. The federal government is inviting people to sign up for the new dental plan, but there are questions about eligibility. People who already have private insurance can't apply. But CBC News has heard from senior, seniors who are wondering whether those who drop their private plans are eligible. They say there's no clear answer yet, and they point out that private insurance premiums can be a burden, especially for seniors. The federal government is putting nearly 200 million additional dollars into programs that help shelters and low-income renters. Today, I'm announcing a $99 million top-up to the Canada Housing Benefit. This benefit helps make rent affordable by delivering rent support payments directly to Canadians. The Finance Minister also announced another $100 million for programs to help shelters create more spaces for homeless people. The funding is going to 85 communities across the country to help them deliver temporary rental assistance and meals. On Sunday, Ottawa announced it is extending the ban on home sales to foreign nationals and companies until 2027. After nearly two months on hold, the Canada-U.S. rivalry series will continue in Saskatoon tomorrow. 
The best female hockey players in both countries will don their colours in what will be a do-or-die game for Canada. Dane Patterson has a preview. The historical rivalry between the two hockey field countries reignites on Canadian turf after a break since December 16th and there's already fire on the ice. Canada is coming into the game on their back foot. Down in the series, the U.S. won victory away from taking the series, but the players are still working hard, playing in the newly created Professional Women's Hockey League. We've been going to the PWHL where we've been uh, practicing and playing a lot of games, so I think tomorrow, uh, just for us, we know it's a big game. Uh, they're up 3-1 in their series, and we know uh, we've got to get that, that win, so we're going to have to focus on ourselves and uh, play our game. Well, the series holds a lot of value to any player in the red and white or blue and white, Battling it out in Saskatoon means a lot more to some of them. Two players on the Canadian team are from the Bridge City, and their fans are happy they're home. You know, when I was five years old, I got to meet Dana and Tell here, and that one single autograph fueled my dream to make the Olympic team one day. So to know that the young, young girls and boys get to see this caliber of hockey and get inspired by us, uh, today and tomorrow, it really, really means a lot to me. Clark grew up playing in Saskatoon, but never a pro game. She says there's a good chance her last game here was either in a beer league or at the Saskatoon Stars as a team. But since then, her game day rituals have changed. I mean, there is this pizza shop that's close to my um, house. I used to have lasagna and pizza from when I was 16, but I don't know if it would, it would sit quite the same now that I'm a little older. This rivalry series Zambonis the way to the World Championship in April. While there's no tournament value to the series, triumph over an age-old rival holds its own value. Canada's head coach is focused on making a comeback, but also thinking about the end goal, prepping to win Worlds. Last year we were down 3-1 and found a way to win the series, but also knowing that success in the Robber Series doesn't ultimately mean success in a World Championship. Canada's best female hockey players will attempt to come back against the rival American team in the fifth game of the rivalry series at Saskatchewan Centre on Wednesday night. Dane Patterson, CBC News, Saskatoon. Well, how fun is this? Shelly Bridgman and her daughter made the best of their icy street last night. Freezing rain has made roads and sidewalks slippery in the Bridge City. This is certainly one way to get around or just have some fun. There is more flurries in the forecast for Saskatoon. Ashwarya Duda will have the details after the break. Stay with us. Ottawa says help is on its way to Nova Scotia. A historic winter storm buried parts of the province under as much as 150 centimetres of snow. The massive storm has hit several provinces across Atlantic Canada. Roads, schools, offices and many businesses are closed. Heather Gillis reports. In Sydney, Nova Scotia, the hardest hit area, Myrna Murphy is buried deep. She estimates there's snow nearly two metres high in her driveway. The dig out isn't close to finished. Now the problem is, is it's heavy and it's becoming solid. I, I have no idea of how we'll get rid of this. I think it's the worst we've ever had. I remember growing up, we'd have this over the course of a winter, but not in one storm. The federal government is answering Nova Scotia's request for help, sending Parks Canada snow clearing equipment and personnel and Coast Guard choppers for critical supplies and the evacuation of people isolated and at risk. Help is coming from neighbouring New Brunswick and PEI too. Roads in the region still clogged with snow, but now partially passable thanks to snow plows and heavy equipment like here in Charlottetown. They're working around the clock to clean up, according to the mayor. And the priority is for emergency services, police, fire, ambulances uh, to get to any spot they have to in case of emergency. Speaking of emergency responders on PEI, well, they've been busy too. They've answered between two and 300 calls from the public uh, and the vast majority of these are all in concerning vehicles getting stuck and uh, people trying to navigate through this weather. Plow operator Tyler McQuarrie says he's ready for a rest. It's been hard. Last, lot, long hours and a lot of Snow come down and over 64 centimeters, I was told. 
While for this boy, with school closed for two days now, it's playtime here on this mountain in his front yard. It's a bit scary. It's, it's very high. This system hasn't spared Newfoundland and Labrador either, dumping 43 centimeters on Wreck House on Newfoundland's west coast since this weekend. Now, this weather started as rain in St. John's this morning and transitioned over to snow, closing down government offices, schools, and some daycares. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Meanwhile, in Alberta, they are already contending with wildfires. The snowfall there over the weekend didn't help much. Right now, 57 wildfires are burning across their province. We didn't receive a whole ton of snow. I know that we've gotten more down in the southern parts of the province. Um, we've seen trace amounts up in the northern parts of the province. So the wildfire danger is still pretty elevated uh, across Alberta. The province can't truly say what the wildfire season is going to look like until spring because rain is a good determinant of how intense the wildfire season could be. The weather update is brought to you by Capital Ford Lincoln. Trade and upgrade is on now. Well, we have a live look now at the Broadway Bridge in Saskatoon, where it is currently minus three degrees. Ashwarya Duda joins me now with a look at your forecast. Have you been enjoying spring? Well, it might be over. More on that, but first, let's take a look at the current conditions. A cold front moving in from the north, keeping things nice and seasonal in the far north. Uh, even down to Larange, minus 15 over there, minus 14 in Buffalo Narrows. In Lloyd Minster, it was minus 10 earlier today. And zooming into south and central, it's warmer towards the southeastern side of the province. Minus 2 in Regina, Moose Jaw, and Yorkton. And then it gets uh, cooler as you move towards the west and up north. Uh, Saskatoon, minus 3. Meadow Lake, minus 9. Prince Albert at minus 8. And sky conditions continue to be cloudy, something that we've been seeing the past few days, pretty much blanketed in cloud cover across the province. And, take, and that's in advance to a system that's coming in tomorrow. And things are going to start to switch up a bit overnight as that system moves in. We're expecting flurries and even a risk of freezing rain with those warmer temperatures in Yorkton, Regina, Estevan. Estevan will see the most of it, but also expecting some precipitation around Saskatoon and Prince Albert area and that system quickly moves out of the province uh, eastwards into Manitoba and down south towards the state. With that system comes moisture and fog, a theme that we've been seeing the past few days, and that means visibility will be affected, especially along the highways 1 and 16 around Yorkton and the Musaman area. In terms of how much we're expecting uh, the accumulation amounts, definitely larger towards the southeastern side of the province. 35 centimeters in Yorkton, 25 in Kansak, and then it gets lesser as you move towards the west. Uh, Regina will get about 12 centimeters, Saskatoon 13 centimeters, Kindersley just about 4 centimeters. And Regina, let's take a look at what it's going to be like over the next seven days. As that system passes through tomorrow, temperature will be at the freezing mark, but we're expecting some flurries or freezing rain. And then that cloud cover sticks around for the rest of the week before temperatures drop closer to seasonal into the week and next week. Saskatoon, you might not feel as much of an impact from that system tomorrow, but still a slight chance of some light snow, some flurries or freezing rain tomorrow and then uh, into the next week. We're, we have a bit of a messy weekend, but we're expecting some sunshine, Sam, as we get into next week. Europe is fighting the measles. Cases have exploded over the last year, and as COVID has demonstrated, distance is no longer an issue for viruses. Lauren Pelly looks at the concerns here. Across the pond, a virus few people think about anymore has made a grim return. New data show there were more than 40,000 measles cases across Europe in 2023, a 40-fold increase from just one year before. Measles is probably the most infectious human virus uh, that is uh, known. In fact, everybody. This World Health Organization official says Canada it could spread again in Canada vaccinated. just as easily. And what's happened is, over the course of the pandemic, we've had a historic backsliding in the immunization rates around the world. 20 children died from measles or complications from measles. 
Measles was once a common childhood illness capable of causing pneumonia, brain damage, or blindness. It also kills up to three out of every thousand children infected. Canada did wipe out the disease decades ago through widespread vaccination programs. Now, most new infections are required outside the country. Globalization and travel means that, you know, another country's problem can become our problem within literally hours. One recent case of the highly contagious infection in Windsor, Ontario, was linked to possible exposures at multiple locations, including Pearson International Airport. If somebody with measles goes into a store, leaves, and you go in 90 minutes later, if you are not vaccinated against measles, you can get measles. Canada's target for measles vaccine coverage is 95%, but the latest data show the percentage of vaccinated kids seven and under has been dropping from 87% in 2017 to 83% in 2019 to just 79% by 2021. Doctors say the best way to keep measles from roaring back in Canada is to get more people up to date on the vaccine. Otherwise, the fear is it's not a matter of if this virus will spark more outbreaks, but when. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Country singer Toby Keith has died after a two-year battle with stomach cancer. I should have been a cowboy. Standing 6'4", he was an oil worker and he played semi-pro football before hitting it big in music. His first, his first hit single was 1993's Should Have Been a Cowboy. Swagger and patriotism characterized his lyrics. He notched 20 number one hits and sold 40 million albums. His social media page today said he fought cancer with grace and courage. Keith was 62. I know it feels like spring, but winter is not done just yet. And you'll see that in Regina. Let's take a look. Tonight, midnight temperature will be minus two, and those clouds will stick around through the night. As that system rolls in, we'll see some flurries at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Temperature remains the same all the way up until the noon hour, and we'll continue to see some of that precipitation in the form of either freezing rain or some flurries. Saskatoon as well going to see some flurries tonight. Temperature minus four at midnight, dropping, uh, rising rather to minus three by 8 a.m., and then we'll see some light snow as we get into the noon hour. So Sam, uh, that system coming in tomorrow, definitely going to see some form of precipitation, either light snow, freezing rain or flurries across the province. Thanks, Ashwarya. And before we go, the nominations are out for this year's Juno Awards. The final nominees for this year's Juno Awards. Montreal singer Charlotte Cardin leads the way with six nominations. Tor Toronto's Daniel Caesar has five. Both are nominated for Best Artist, Best Album and Best Single. And while newer performers dominated, veteran acts are also on the list. That includes Nickelback, The Arkells and Shania Twain. The awards show is March 24th in Halifax. And of course, you can watch that on CBC. That is it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can head to cbc.ca slash sask. You can subscribe to the CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel or download the CBC News app on your phone or tablet. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.